This lecture will be on the equivalence of the unified derivatives equations and the chain rule for computing derivatives of a composite function. So let's take a look at a function that looks something like this. You have x, you have y, you have z, and x feeds both y and z, and y also feeds z. Or we could write that like this. x, the x variable is equal to the x function of nothing, so that's just a constant, essentially. The y variable is equal to the y function of x, and the z variable is equal to the z function of x and y. So this is a composite function because what we actually care about is z, but in order to get there, we first have to compute y. And that's what makes it a composite function. Now, if things are being simple, these could all be scalar functions, but they don't have to be. So let's assume x is of size L, y is of size M, and z is of size N. Now, for simple functions, x, y, and z could be scalars, but we don't have to assume they're scalars. So we'll assume they're vectors, and we'll assume they're three different length vectors. So x is of size l, y is of size m, and z is of size n. That'll make it slightly more interesting. Now if you've used the regular chain rule, then you can compute the derivative that you're looking for pretty easily. So the derivative we're looking for here is the total derivative of z with respect to x, and that would equal the partial derivative of z, the function, with respect to x, plus the partial derivative of z function with respect to y, times the total derivative of y with respect to x. Now, because these are all vector-valued functions, these are all actually matrices, which makes this a matrix equation. So this is just the regular chain rule. To apply the unified derivatives equations, we have to make an implicit transformation of these equations. So I'll just write the equations again. x equals x of nothing. y equals y of x. And z equals z of x and y. And the implicit transformation of that, I'm going to assemble a single vector which is just going to be x, y, and z. So just concatenating all the variables together into one vector. And then I'm going to define a residual equation, r of u, which is going to be x minus x star, where x star is just some constant. That's your design variable. y minus y of x, and z minus z of x and y. So that is my residual vector. So I am solving that residual vector to find the values of x, y, and z such that the residual will be driven to zero and when I do that I will know all the values there for u that I'm looking for and, and hence I will know z. Okay. 
I'm going to call this the unknown vector. And this is my residual form, or my residual vector. So now the unified derivatives equations say that I can compute the total derivative that I want, which again is dz dx. They say I can compute that like this. I can take the partial derivative of the residual vector with respect to the, the unknown vector, and I can solve a linear system that will give me du dx, so that is the change of the entire unknown vector with respect to the change of the x variable. And I get that by solving, or if I multiply these two, I will get this. Now this equation comes from the unified derivatives equations. I will put a link to the paper that defines these, those equations in the description below. But this is a linear system where this is a simple matrix, easy to compute because it's all partial derivatives. This right-hand side is known partial derivatives here. Those are easy to compute and cheap. The right-hand side is known, right? And I've put the i here in the x position so that I get du dx. If I had put the i in any other position on this right-hand side, I would have gotten du dy or du dz. But by putting the i here, I got du dx. And I, if I know this and I know this, that is a linear system that lets me solve for that for the total derivatives, right? And so that's the goal that I want. I want to solve for those total derivatives. Let's just take a quick look at those partial derivatives. I told you they were easy to compute. We can write them down really quickly. So we'll look at drx dx. That is equal to 1, or i in this case, because it's a matrix. And then drx dy is equal to 0, and drx dz is also equal to 0, right? Because there is no dependence on y or z in the x residual right here. So now we're going to look at the y residual. I can write those partial derivatives. dry dx is going to equal minus the partial of the y function with respect to x. dry dy is going to equal the identity matrix. And dry dz is going to equal 0 because, again, you see there is no dependence on z in that residual. And so the next one we can write out is the z residual. drz dx going to equal minus dz dx, drz dy is going to equal minus dz dy, drz dz is going to equal identity. And these identities come from this part of the residual here, right? So. That's where the identity for that one comes from, and there. All right, so we've computed all those partials now. We can actually assemble them into the matrix form required by the unified derivatives equations, just like this. dz dy and the identity matrix. Here is the solution that we're looking for. And the right hand side looks like this. Now, I want to point out at this point that this is a identity matrix. In other words, there are 
L columns of this because remember X is of size L and we are solving for du dx. The solution vector right here is of size L M N. So this guy is of size L plus M plus N by L. That's this guy. Same for this one. L plus M plus N by L. And this one, this matrix has to be square. It's L plus M plus N by L plus M plus N. So this is a linear system. You have to solve it L times, one, for, one time for each column in the right-hand side. But when you do that, if you solve this linear system, the unified derivatives equations say that what comes out of the solution will be du dx, and inside du dx, obviously you can find dz dx as the lower column in there. In fact, let's write that out just so it's clear what we mean by du dx. What we would end up with is dx dx dy dx clean that up clean that up a little bit right up here dz dx now this is the term we actually care about but we will compute all of the terms when we use the unified derivatives equations now you could use any technique you wanted to to solve this linear system one simple approach would just be to build this matrix up say in python with numpy or in matlab and then compute its inverse multiply the inverse by the right hand side and you'd be done but I want to show you a different algorithm that you could use. Obviously, there's, this matrix is lower triangular, so we can use a forward substitution approach. And I want to show you how when you use the forward substitution approach, which is sort of like one iteration of block gauss seidel how you end up with exactly the same thing as what you would have gotten in the chain rule. Now, it starts out a little bit weird because we're solving a very degenerate uh, version of the problem on the first row, but let's start there anyway. So if we look at the first row here, which has to deal with the x block, so we're talking about this row right here. We don't have any dependence on y or z because these two terms are 0. And because those two terms are 0, I can solve the system for dx dx straight up. And quite degenerately, I end up with i dx dx equals i, which quite obviously means that dx dx equals identity. And at this point, you are saying no duh. Right? That is a trivial result, and it is obviously true. But necessary first step. So now we know the value for dx dx. Let's write out the equation for the next row, for the y block, this row. So we have minus dy dx, and I can multiply that by dx dx, since I know those terms now, that's just from the matrix, that's just from the equation we get, right? That's this term multiplied by this term. And then I can add i times dy dx, which I do not yet know. And I can say that it equals 0, right? So the i dy dx. And then there's no contribution from z, so we don't care about this term, right? No contribution there, so we don't care about that term. And then the right-hand side. So we write out all that out, and we get this equation. Now, obviously, we can make at least one small simplification, because there's an identity matrix here. But we also happen to know that this one goes to identity. 
So we can simplify this to minus dy dx plus dy dx equals 0, or dy dx equals dy dx. Now again, this is not earth shattering. It is obviously true, but it's nice to confirm that it comes out of the unified derivatives equations as well. And you can see where that came from in terms of expanding out this row of the matrix equation. So lastly, let's look at the third row, the z row here. And this is the one that we're actually interested in. So let's take a look. If we write out the equation defined here, we're going to get minus dz dx times dx dx minus dz dy times dy dx plus the identity matrix, and these are all matrices. times dz dx. Oops, make sure my notation stays constant here. And again, equal to 0. Well, we can bring these two terms over, this term and this term, because I know I have already solved for these guys. And so I can bring those guys over to the right-hand side and then solve the resulting linear system. But in this case, that linear system is again trivial to solve because of the identity matrix here. And so if I do all that, I get dz dx equal minus dz dx, because remember, this guy was identity, right? And there's no minus sign, because it's been brought over to the other side, plus dz dy. And these are all matrices again, times dy dx. And if you'll note, This equation is exactly what you would have gotten if you had used the chain rule in the beginning. So the unified derivatives equations gives exactly the same result as the chain rule. So why would you want to use it? Obviously, I had to do a little bit more work assembling this linear system and then writing all these terms out and multiplying by identity. It seems a little inefficient. However, there is a clear advantage to using the unified derivatives equations if I make one small change to the system of equations that I'm dealing with. So this time, we'll start with the exact same form. x feeding y feeding z, just like before. However, this time, I want to make the y function also a function of z. And so this changes the situation quite significantly. So if I wrote that out, it looks like this. Now, x is a function of nothing, like before. y is a function of not just x now, but also z. So we have this new term here. And z is a function, same as before, of x and y. So the only new term is this one, highlighted in yellow. But it does fundamentally change the situation, because you can't write out the simple chain rule for this anymore. You actually still can manually differentiate this. It takes a little bit more work, right? But the derivative is no longer the simple chain rule that you were using before. And so I'll actually leave the manual differentiation of this system for a different lecture. We'll talk about that another time. But what I do want to talk about 
is that this system is not any harder to differentiate when you're using the unified derivatives equations. So just as before, we're going to write dr du du dx equals identity, right? And I've chosen, once again, I've chosen this right-hand side very specifically, putting this identity block in the x position so that I get those derivatives out. This looks identical to before. The only thing that's changed now, just like before, we still have drx dx equal to identity, dry, oops, drx dy equal to drx dz equal to zero. Now dr y dx still equals minus dy dx, just like before. dry dy equals identity, just like before. But dry dz is no longer 0 like it was before. Now it is d, oops, dy dz. So we have this new term here, and then the rest of the terms are identical to before. drz minus dz dx drz dy equals minus dz dy and drz dz equals identity. And if you remember, these negative signs and these identities come from the form of the equation. For example, you'll note that ry is going to equal y minus the y function times x and z. And so when we assemble all of this into the unified derivatives equations, it looks like this. Got identity along the diagonal, just like before. The top row has a 0 in it. This term, just like before, is now dy function dx, negative sign. So that comes from here. This identity comes from here. And now we have to deal with this guy right here. Minus dy dz. And then these bottom two terms are the same as they were before. And then we just need our right hand side like that. And now if we solve this system the same as before, when we get our final result we will end up with dx dx dy dx and dz dx. But everything is the same except you need to note that there's this new term here. And that new term comes from this new partial, which came from this modification, which showed up because of this coupling. Now, just like before, you can solve this linear system, which comes from the unified derivatives equations, any way you want. If you were inverting it, just computing a factorization or an inverse, then you're done. It's the exact same system. You just filled in this term that used to be 0 with a non-zero value. If you were using a substitution method, like the one I showed you, you'd just have to turn that into an iterative substitution method, which turns out to be the same thing as a block Gauss-Seidel algorithm. But the point is, is that the unified derivatives equations do offer an advantage in this situation because whether or not this z term exists, whether or not there's coupling here, you can use the exact same form. And that is why the unified derivatives equations are valuable, because if each one of these blocks represents a component in OpenMDAO, then it is very valuable for the framework to be able to differentiate the total derivatives of the system the same whether or not this term is present. 
whether or not you could have used the simple chain rule or you actually need to use a much more advanced direct or adjoint formulation. But regardless of that, in OpenMDAO, we use the unified derivatives equations. That's why the unified derivatives equations are valuable. That's why we use them in OpenMDAO. And that's why you might consider writing the structure of your software to utilize them as well.